Welcome to Book TV's Afterword. I'm here with Jay Perini, prolific author, also professor of English. You've written a new book called Promised Land, 13 Books That Changed America. How did you come to write this book? Well, it's funny. That's a fun question, and I sort of begin the book talking about this, because people might wonder, why would somebody write such a weird book? Um, I was living in London a few years ago with my wife and my youngest kid, and one night, it was a hot summer night in uh, Hampstead, my wife said, there's a talk down the street. Um, Lord Melvin Bragg is going to talk about the 12 books that changed the world. And I didn't want to go. I had something else to do. And she dragged me to it. And I'm, I'm grateful to her for dragging me there because um, it was a huge crowded audience. And I saw that his book was a big bestseller. And um, and it turned out all of these were English books. Every single one of the books that changed the world was English. And I felt a little patriotic. And I was sitting there with my program notes. And I thought, well, what would be the 12 books that changed America, whatever change means? And I began scribbling in the margin of uh, these things. And, and then I got home that night into our flat in Hampstead, and I was lying in bed and uh, completely unable to sleep. I just got out of bed because I couldn't stop making this list. And I stayed up all night sitting at the kitchen table, Huckleberry Finn, you know, going through what would be the really essential American books that fundamentally shifted or in many ways clarified or served as nodal points for our culture. Um, and uh, I emailed all my friends back in Middlebury and various colleges and writer friends. And people began sending me what they thought would be the essential dozen books. Finally, I wound up with 13. I thought it was analogous with the 13 colonies. And, and I just couldn't, I couldn't boil it down beyond 13. I felt I needed a book on an immigration memoir as one of these books. And I put in Mary Anton's Promised Land. Then that gave me my title, Promised Land. And it was, you know, the period of the late days of the Bush administration. Uh, well, not the late, not late enough, but it was <laughs> into the Bush, Bush administration, the second term. I was very demoralized, and I had for some years been feeling very down about America. You know, I, I, I came from a very hopeful family. Uh, my family were Italian American immigrants, and uh, where did you grow up? Scranton, Pennsylvania, which of course was in the news recently with uh, the Joe election. Joe Biden? Joe Biden, from boy from Scranton. In fact, Joe Boy Biden's mother and my mother were old friends back in the old days, and Biden lived down the street from us. The Bidens did. So Scranton is a very, you know, bedrock place. I love Scranton. And um, um, did you think of these as bedrock books, the 13? That's a good question, bedrock <laughs> books. You know, these. I'll emphasize to you people watching this, these are not the 13 greatest books. I, I, I would not even be, dream of going there and choosing the greatest books. I don't even say the 13 books that changed America. Just here are 13 books that really did have an impact. impact. In fact, I should have called the book 13 books that shaped America rather than change. That's uh, a bit of a loaded word. Well, but what do you mean by change in this context? Well, well what I mean by change <coughs> is here are books that serve as landmarks for certain intellectual traditions in the culture, certain motions in the culture. Um, I was trying in this book to essentially take an x-ray of the American psyche using books as a way into the American psyche. And so these are 13 books that I think really help to build this strange thing called the American character. I think we do have a character. And I think more than we realize it, we've been shaped by the books that we've that have been, that we've read, or that have somehow seeped into the unconscious of the people. So one thing you've done is to cover a very long time span. You really go back to the beginning. Let's start with some of the books. The first one is a Plymouth Plantation. Tell us a little bit about that book. We, it has an unusual yes. history. Yeah. Well, I think that was part of the fun part for me. I thought, where do you begin a book about America? Well, the Pilgrims landing in Plymouth Rock, and and one of the books I've taught for, th well, I've been teaching now for nearly nearly 40 years. Most of that time at Middlebury. Most of that, a lot of that time at Middlebury College. Before that, a little bit at Dartmouth. And before that, I was in St. Andrews in Scotland and at Oxford for a while. And um, so I've been teaching American culture and literature for, for nearly four decades. And so here, I, I went, go, went back to the Pilgrims. And this was a book, as you say, that had a wonderful story behind it. And each of these stories, it turns out, has a marvelous sort of backstory. As far as Plymouth Plantation goes, the Pilgrims come into Mayflower, they land. Governor Bradford, young man, is elected governor by his cohorts. Um, and he governs for decades the Plymouth colony. He keeps this marvelous diary of Plymouth Plantation. 
and then it's lost. The manuscript disappeared for hundreds of years. It wasn't this, he, he, remember the pilgrims were 1620 landing and he was writing this book up until 1647 when it breaks off. And um, it tells the wonderful story of, of how the pilgrims got along with the Indians, the local uh, Wampanoag Indians and so forth, uh, with their great chief um, and so forth. And um, the manuscript was lost and an American tourist wandering in London came across the manuscript in the Bishop's Library at the in London uh, up on the Thames. When was this? This was in the, in the middle of the 19th century. And so he copied it out by hand, brought it back to the United States, and um, it was published and it was hugely influential. Everybody bought the book. It was a popular bestseller in those days. Now was it the diary known of during the time it was missing? Was this something people had been looking for? Yes, because there were, in, in lots of reflections and histories of the Pilgrim Fathers, some of the early Pilgrim Fathers mentioned the diaries. They said, oh yes, and then there's the wonderful journal kept by our governor. And people wondered where it was. And so when it was discovered, it was a huge literary discovery. Abraham Lincoln read it during the Civil War, and he was so moved by this beautiful story of how people can get along in this country that he, he declared um, Thanksgiving a national holiday. Now, most Americans don't realize that it was Abraham Lincoln who created Thanksgiving or understand that this was a kind of act of myth-making on the part of Abraham Lincoln. And so the whole idea, the beautiful description of the first Thanksgiving that we get in a Plymouth plantation really wasn't present in the American mind until the middle of the 19th century. And so this was a book that shaped America long after it was written. I think so. I think the shaping took place when, I mean, what I say is all of these 13 books are to some degree or another myth-making books. They really created stories about ourselves. And stories, every, every culture has stories of its own origin. You know, the Roman, the Roman Empire has, you know, Romulus and Remus. Uh, all the cultures have uh, stories about how they began. And this is one of our primary founding myths. It has a lot of flaws in it. It's, uh, myths are myths. They're not necessarily true stories, but they're stories that have a shaping power. And I think the story of the pilgrims landing on Plymouth Rock, surviving the first winter, having help from the local tribes, and just the whole politics of the Plymouth colony are fascinating. And part of the, every American psyche, we learn this stuff in elementary school, even though we don't know where we got it from. Now, another book you write about, which our viewers will be very aware of, is the Federalist Papers. Yeah. And in, in a sense, they weren't really a book at all. Yeah. The Federalist Papers is something I read first in college. I took a course on American um, Constitution, and we read um, the Federalist Papers. That was, you know, 1966 I first read that book. And um, it stayed in my mind all this time as, as, as a very luminous book, which I've dipped into throughout my life. And, but when I went back to reread it, I thought, wow, what a book this is. It's written by somebody called Publius, who doesn't exist. It's a, it's a, an, a general name chosen by John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. And they wrote these 85 individual essays, kind of ad hoc, to try to convince Americans to ratify the new proposed U.S. Constitution. 1887, con the Philadelphia Convention. Where were these essays published? Published in New, in New York newspapers, which largely to convince New Yorkers to get behind the, the new Constitution. And then these disseminated throughout the entire th colonies. And, um, and there was a lot of back and forth. Remember, there was a huge anti-federalist movement. There were people like um, George Mason, after whom George Mason University is founded, who thought that the U.S. Constitution was an incredibly bad idea, a flawed document. And there were, you know, there was a guy called Federal Farmer who wrote under that pseudonym. And, and we don't know who he, who he was, no, right? No, we don't. We don't know who Federal Farmer was. But there were a lot of anti-Federalists, and the debate was raging. And we, p Americans sometimes forget how much uh, this was up for grabs, the U.S. Constitution. What were the main issues of contention when the Constitution uh, was written, ratified, and when these these founders were quarreling about. Well, under the, under the uh, previous um, organization, the Articles of Confederation, right? Um, uh, states had immense powers, and so w the states were going to have to give up an awful lot of their independence and give it to a federal government. And so there was a tremendous fear of this. 
and there was a fear essentially of democracy too. What if the mob takes control of the United States and then we're going to have mob rule? Um, remember democracy was a very beginning idea. It was a fairly new thing in the world. The French Revolution hadn't even really gotten going yet and uh, although we, we stole our ideas from all the French thinkers. I mean one of the things I say about this about the Federalist Papers is wow how lucky we were that our founding fathers were so well educated.